Hi there, and welcome to The Works. I'm Ben Shea. And I'm Ben Peltier. In tonight's show, a series of concerts that aims to give young and up-and-coming musicians a chance to perform. We also have a local exhibition about a 20th century artist for whom even a soup can could be art. He's Andy Warhol. In our film review, turn away from that Transformers nonsense and go see Tree of Life. That's the advice of our reviewer, Gary Pollard. First, though, when artists get popular, their work gets expensive. So expensive that people like us probably can't afford it. In one project, local artist Amy Chung has been asking, if art's so expensive most of us can't even afford to look at it, doesn't it lose its point? After London and New York, Hong Kong is the third largest auction center for Sotheby's and Christie's. In April alone, Sotheby's sales in Hong Kong fetched two billion Hong Kong dollars. The auction of the Ulins collection sold all 105 contemporary Chinese artworks on the block and set a record for a single owner sale, bringing in 427 million. Hong Kong has become a driving force in the global art market. Art Hong Kong 11, which ran in May, has grown by leaps and bounds and has now become an international brand under the umbrella of Swiss Art Basel. Among all the glitter at the fair this year, Amy Chern decided to ask some fundamental questions about art. In the context of art fair, everything is about price. And is price equal to value? So that is my question. And I want the public to be able to own a great work of art, which is uh, not about if they can afford or not. It is about a chance. Everybody can pay $20 and purchase this chance. A grantee of the Asian Cultural Council, Amy Jung created this chance machine for the council's booth. She also invited 15 artists from different disciplines, who are also ACC fellows, to reflect on the question, can you put a price tag on value? She asked the artist to choose an object that embodied the values they believed in. She then photographed them and created these light boxes. All these different artists, from dance, from uh, visual art, from uh, film, from music, they all were chasing for their dream or they do not uh, care or they do not calculate about the price of their work. They calculate the value that contributes to their existence. Amy also invited one of the best-selling Chinese contemporary artists, Yu Min Jun, to take part. This piece by him, Good Luck in the Year of the Rabbit, is the jackpot of the chance machine. Participants at the fair purchased a chance to win the 15 light boxes and use work for $20. I put the interview of each artist next to the, the prize, the light box. So you need to um, read through the, the text and find the two value words. And then, so when you find it, if you press the button and these two value words come up on the top, then you will win that light box. Although eight lucky members of the public did win the light boxes, the jackpot, use work, remains unclaimed. Last week, the winners of the light boxes and the participating artists came together to share their experiences. So this is the, the first page. Theatre director Olivia Yan went to New York to study in 2000. While there, she wrote a number of journals documenting her travel and learning experiences. The sense of insecurity she felt there enabled her to rethink her values. Artist and choir conductor Bethan Greaves won the light box containing Olivia's object, one of her New York journals. As someone who makes art, I, it's, it's definitely it's an, interesting, um, an interesting problem. You know, are you making it to sell it? Are you making it for yourself? And then if somebody wants to buy it, that's fine. And then, you know, the whole idea of how much, how much do you charge for something that you made? It, it was the result of a process that you really enjoyed doing and you got a lot out of. And then to try and put a price on that is, I, I, I'm not there yet, so. <laughs> yeah, 
You'll have to come and see me in a year or so's time. <laughs> Theatre director Frederick Mao said that his youthful dream of being an artist is what keeps him going. To him, fame, money, power, greed, position, illusions are all smoke and mirrors. Yeah, Joining in the discussion with Amy at the art fair were poet Leung Ping Kwan and art administrator and educator Oscar Ho. As the artist in that story said, art doesn't have to be expensive or about expensive things. In the 1950s, in Britain and the United States, a group of artists decided art could be about ordinary things, comics, mass-produced objects, advertising, even soup cans. They were the pop artists, and one of the best known, as famous for making himself famous as for his work, was Andy Warhol. This particular painting uh, my father uh, did uh, a, a few years after my uncle died. My father was uh, six years older uh, than Andy, and he's the older one, and Andy's the younger one. Andy was about 13 years old in this picture. James Warhol is the son of Paul Warhol an elder brother of legendary pop artist Andy Warhol. He's been invited to co-create an exhibition at the Elements Shopping Mall featuring works by his uncle. Apart from referencing well-known Warhol pieces like the Campbell soup cans and portraits of Marilyn Monroe, the show also features previously unpublished works by Warhol. The way I acquired these uh, drawings are, is that uh, he used to give me all his old art supplies uh, along with uh, sketchbooks and I kept these sketchbooks kind of intact uh, all the way up until a few years ago. James Warhola himself is an illustrator of children's books. He says many in his family, including his grandmother, were enlisted in helping Andy with his work before he set up the factory to mass produce it. James Warhola often uses his encounters with his uncle as subjects for his own work. It shows all of us working at his, in, in his studio because uh, he did all his early pop art paintings in his house. I'm the, the young boy here in the striped red shirt and uh, I remember this painting specifically because he asked me if I could rub on the numbers. Bro older brother George, he, uh, he liked to stretch canvases and he learned how to do those. It's my grandmother. She was very helpful to my uncle. He did all kinds of color graphic work for his illustrations. My brothers and sisters were always talking about how uh, when we hear a painting going for like 75 million dollars, we just, we find it so hard to believe because when we grew up, we knew these paintings and like we'd be climbing through them and looking at them. James says this isn't the way his uncle thought art should be. He said that quite a, quite a lot. He, he thought that art should be all around us, it should be accessible. Uh, he, he kind of mass produced it. He used the silk screening process that allowed him to do multiples. He first started off with a soup can. 
And uh, the idea was that uh, he was painting uh, an ordinary object. It allowed people uh, to realize that anything can be art. That's why Andy Warhol described his own work as deeply superficial and firmly believed in the mass production of art pieces. He wanted people to judge his paintings just by what they saw, and he didn't want to explain them. So in a way, he said, you know, they're superficial. The pieces are on show until August 31st.